were just talking about this before we jumped onto this call here, that um, it's just it's it's pretty amazing that we were able to set up this call for this specific day, because as everyone's seen all over the place, all over your timelines, is this this Bitcoin ETF move is is going to change the game, and it's already changed the game in many ways, and now more than ever. There are powerful players in the background that are pulling strings to just really mess with, you know, how how we trade and, and how we exist in this space here. So, uh, first of all, a couple couple quick things here, guys. I um I just started the live stream. So we are now live streaming on X, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And I encourage you guys to check that out. I'm actually gonna take the link to that and post it here in the comments and up on the Jumbotron. Because today, one of the things that we're doing is we're actually going to be jump or sharing, uh, doing a screen share to actually show you guys the um, the data, the objective data that's going on behind all of this to help inform all of us and to see exactly what's been happening and exactly how people have been reacting to these these news and events here. So, um, in saying that here, normally Brian, what we do on this space is we do a bit of a deep dive into kind of your background, what brought you here. But I know timing is of the essence today. So if it's all right with you, I'd love to just jump right in and uh, start looking at the data. Um, how does that sound to you? I love it. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Thank you. Your, there, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So just to clarify, uh, should I keep my my mute on the live stream, but keep it on for the Twitter space or keep it keep audio on for both? Okay, hold on. I'm just going to turn up my volume a little bit here so I can I can hear. Uh, just just try speaking for a second and I'll let you know. Test, test, one, two. Red now it's on both. Uh, my mic is on both the uh, live stream as well as Twitter space. Perfect. You know what? It sounds crystal clear. So uh, yeah, if you keep it like this, then it should be okay. Won't touch a thing. We will, uh, we will share uh, in just a moment on the live stream. So for those tuning in or watching the replay, you should see my screen in a matter of seconds. Excellent. And then, friends, I'm uh, before we dive in, and we are just about to do that. And I'm going to get going on our on our first question here, Ryan and Victor. Um, but I would love to encourage everyone to um, let, let's share the love. This is a really important information that we're going to be sharing today, and it's I would love to be able to share this with the most amount of people possible. Um, so if you can uh, jump bottom right hand corner, give this space a repost and, uh, and let's get it out there. And of course, as for every week, one of the things that we do on our space is the content blow up challenge. So if um, at the end of the space, whoever quote tweets um, this space, we will choose one of you. We will grab one of your posts and we'll have everybody here just blow it right up here. So um, there's the challenge. And uh, if, if it's good with you guys here, let's jump into it. And before I ask my first question, Victor, I was just wondering if there's anything else that you wanted to add here before we dive into it. Oh, I think that we can uh, get right away. I hope that uh, for the people that don't know in the audience, maybe our friend Brian here can introduce like himself and send him in just, you know, very short. Because I think that most people know our body. Yeah, you bet. Uh, sentiment is essentially uh, an on-chain social and development uh metrics platform that provides alpha and tools and analytics to provide you the best uh, picture of exactly where the markets stand at any given time. Uh, we have over 2,700 different assets that we cover, uh, and we have anything from whale data to sentiment data to just how much the actual team is working on the asset and working to improve and innovate at any given time. And it really creates a, a clear picture as to, you know, which assets out there you can trust, where the overall sector is going next, and uh, how you can optimize your portfolio at any given time. We've got a community of well over um, 500 on Discord, tens of thousands overall uh, in terms of user base, people who use the platform. Uh, and we do regular videos. Uh, with guests, or, or I should say, as a guest like myself, with people like you, and solo videos to walk through how our data works on our YouTube channel, which is just Santiment Network, no spaces. Awesome, Brian. I really appreciate that. And then for me personally, I just love to share here real quick that using your tool, Santiment, has actually um, 
empowered me to find several awesome opportunities. I remember using Santamin to be able to find injective right around the beginning of the pump up to around 40 bucks. And uh, I was actually able to make a decent little profit there. And that was strictly from the social sentiment. But what's interesting with that, and I want to pull up a quote here that I, I caught from one of your videos recently, is that you said one of the things that you guys try and um, continually push through sentiment is that price moves in the opposite direction of crowd's expectation. And this is something that I've always thought about but you've actually presented tangible objective data to actually support this. Are you able to elaborate a little bit on this and maybe, you know, um, uh, let us know um, why this is. And if you can maybe tell us a little bit on how we could leverage this information and how we can use it to just be safe in this environment. Sure. Yeah. So you're absolutely spot on. So our mantra at Santamid based on back testing uh, is that, Markets almost always are going in the least predictable direction. So if the crowd unanimously or close to unanimously believes it's time for prices to go up, then we're very close to a top. If the crowd is very pessimistic, let's say they're concerned about the FTX collapse, which happened about a year ago, or you know COVID-19 destroying the sector altogether, which happened back in March of 2020, then we're actually very close to a bottom and those end up being some of the best possible times to invest in crypto. So generally, you know, just as Warren Buffett said in many occasions on uh, the equity sector, similar, similar uh, patterns arise in crypto where extreme reactions in one direction are generally seen by the key stakeholders of crypto and are able to be taken advantage of uh, so that, you know, when there are a bunch of tiny addresses that are trying to sell, those whales will put up a big buy wall and scoop up all of those uh, coins at a cheap price and then pump the price to make them pay for it. Same goes for the other end. Uh, you know, December 2021, when we were just hitting that top and correcting, uh, after the what 68k plus price that Bitcoin had, had gotten to, Ethereum got to about 4,800. They were putting up massive sell walls as the crypto community was talking about what the latest meme coin uh, was going to go to the moon because everything had been erupting at that time. So uh, more often than not, when the crowd gets way too excited or way too pessimistic. Those are the times where uh, sentiments tools can be the most valuable because they show those extreme fluctuations uh, and almost always will result in uh, the crowd's um, unanimous behavior getting punished and, and prices moving the opposite direction. It just makes my day that there's actual substantial data out there to prove this. Um, and I'm really excited to jump into the next question here. And you know what? Um, uh, before I do, Victor, I just want to touch base with you, hear what your thoughts are about this and hear how you're reacting to, uh, to what we're talking about right now. So this is a very exciting topic for me because uh, I'm the kind of people who believes that decisions should be made in general based on data, right? Other than other things, right? But for that, you have to make sure that your data is of good quality. If you don't have good data, you cannot take good decisions, no matter how good are your algorithms. So I was wondering, what is the origin of this data? And if you guys are running some nodes or something. Yeah, we definitely have nodes. Uh, I, yeah. On this space, I don't want to get into the details because we have developers who could explain it far better. But yeah, essentially our platform is made up of many nodes, many uh, very complex proprietary uh, data connections that allow us to tap into the blockchain, uh, many different blockchains, I should say, in real time in order to ensure that data is objective at all times. We use coin market caps data uh, for a large part of our platform. So as long as their, their platform is running smoothly, um, our contract with them allows us to kind of weave through the noise and the complexities of the data that is on the blockchain and put it in a meaningful story that allows people to quickly sort and identify the exact data that they need. Wonderful. Um, hey, I see. 
Go ahead there, Victor. Sorry. Yeah, no, I think that that's a, a great answer. Like, no, no worries about like the technicalities of it. I, I know it's uh, complicated, but I'm happy to hear that you guys are, are using data that, you know, that you know that you can trust as well, right? In other platform, other platforms and doing kind of these little cross checks. I think it's very important. And I have found in my experience, not only as a founder, but also as a the rails at Mitis, that sometimes data is corrupted and people are, are not aware of them. And sometimes it's even worse when you have uh, these community, let's say community driven platforms that have a uh, data availability for everyone, which is great, right? Because anyone can, you know, cooperate and add data and add uh, valuable information, but at the same time, it's kind of complicated because you need to make sure that the data is correct. Otherwise you could be providing information. So I'm super happy to hear the work that you guys are doing. Yeah, thanks so much for the kind words. I mean, we really take our our platform seriously, and we know that similar to Bloomberg or other data platforms for similar sectors, we have a very uh, important responsibility to keep the news as accurate as possible at all times, be objective with our analysis of the types of assets and uh, projects that we talk about are based on the crowd's interests. We don't play favorites. We don't have a, you know, a secret um, huge investment fund where we try to manipulate markets. That's always an accusation that any successful platform faces, especially one that has data like us. Uh, but we really take our responsibilities seriously to ensure that our focus is based on what the crowd is talking about. And we have those exact tools uh, for those watching my screen share right now, I can actually show you uh, that we have this, this section called social trends, where we can look at the top 10 keywords that are spreading on social media at any given time or trending tokens, which is what I'm showing here. And you can actually see, you know, which assets are getting the most discussion uh, by percentage compared to its normal resting average. And unsurprisingly, right now, the top two topics are Bitcoin and Ethereum, which are usually not the case because they're always being talked about a lot. And usually it's some, um, you know, random small asset that had been pumping that is getting, you know, onto our trending list. But with the ETFs being at the forefront of everyone's attention right now, it makes perfect sense why they're at the top. Uh, you can see below, you know, we've got assets like Lido Dow, which has been on a big run. XAI, which I think is trending for another reason. Uh, REQ is another one trending due to its pump pond SSV. These are the kind of assets that we'll look at and say, okay, the crowd has special interest in it. So we're going to report on some of the most enticing and intriguing metrics that we recommend watching. If this is an asset that you're trying to long or trying to short, or you just try to analyze for some project you're working on. And that's really the approach that we try to take. I had all of these, all, all of these numbers and these charts is just, uh, it, it's activating that uh, part of your brain that just fires you right up here. So Brian, I'm, I'm ready to get into it here. So um, I know timing is of the essence for you right now. We don't have much time left here. So here's what I'm hoping well, we can accomplish in the next couple of minutes here, Brian. And let me know what you think about this. So first, um, as promised, I would love to dive into uh, the data that's that's happening behind Bitcoin right now, as the um, the sentiment is at an all time high. And also, I would love to um, go into what are two ways that anyone who's interested in using your platform can use it. Um, and I would love to frame this in a way of speaking to beginner or intermediate investors, um, people who may not know too too much about on chain data. And um, I speak to them on, on you know, the, the benefits that they can get from this. So um, how does that sound to you, my friend? Yeah, absolutely. And I know we talked uh, about a set time limit for the space ahead of time. I'm more than happy to go, you know, five, 10 minutes past that time, assuming you guys have the bandwidth, just so we can digest uh, the special situation that we're in right now with crypto. I don't want to rush it too much. Um, but I absolutely, we can, we can talk a little on where Bitcoin currently stands in terms of its objective on-chain social and development metrics, um, expand that to some of the altcoins. Um, and to lead things off, uh, I can answer your last question, which is how people can really use our platform. And 
I really recommend starting with uh, honing in on whales. Uh, I, whales, just as they were 10 years ago, are still as important, if not even more important, uh, today in terms of their influence on where markets go next. Uh, we have quite a few different metrics that um, give you a peek into you know what the top X amount of addresses are doing at any given time. Sometimes, d depending on the asset, it, it may just be um, some sort of bridge wallet or um, staking wallet that is not relevant to an individual's holdings and, and behavior on whether they're trying to buy or sell. But something like Bitcoin, which is a bit mysterious in terms of, of who these whales and sharks are um, and even where they're located at times. You know, we know most of them, but there are some where we don't even know if it's an exchange or non-exchange wallet. All we can do is sort by size to an extent and see, you know, what are sharks and whales doing at any given moment? And on my screen right now, I'm showing um, a few different lines at the same time. This bright green line here Right. Be... So I, I apologize to jump in here, but just um, to take a quick pause, do you mind just defining what exactly a whale and a shark is for anyone here who might not uh, be familiar with those terms? Yeah, of course. So generally, a shark or whale is someone who is near the top of the food chain, if you will, in terms of their uh, overall stake and overall holding portion of the asset. Bitcoin, of course, is so large being the number one market cap asset that there is no single address that can um, single-handedly make the asset go to the moon or, or plummet to the ground. Uh, but they do have enough influence to be able to start a bull cycle for a while or start a bear cycle for a while, depending on what their preference is, because they have such a large amount of capital to move prices at any given whim. So we generally define a shark or whale for Bitcoin as someone that holds between 10 all the way up to 10,000 BTC. Um, generally 10 to 100 is more in the shark range, 100 to 10,000. That's when you're talking about, uh, if I'm doing the math, you're talking about $4.6 million all the way up to $460 million as of the time of uh, market prices right now. And uh, generally when they are moving up and accumulating prices tend to move up with them. If they're dumping and, and taking profit, that's when you have to be a little bit concerned, uh, because their influence and ability to keep prices propped up, uh, is, is being jeopardized due to their lower percentage of the supply of health. Um, so one of the first things I like to show on my, uh, weekly market updates is whether they're accumulating or dumping. And uh, it may be surprising to some, but they've actually been steadily dumping, not to an extreme degree, um, but during the, all of this ETF madness, they haven't exactly been scooping up more and more Bitcoin the way some people were hoping. Um, about six months ago, they were holding 67.07% of the supply or about 13.02 million total BTC. That's combined wallets that all hold between 10 to 10,000 BTC. So they were holding a little more than two thirds of the supply. Now they're down to 66.51% or 13.03 million. So between six months ago, they dropped uh, about, about half a percentage, if not a little more of the entire supply, which is a lot. However, because there are new coins being minted all the time and, and mined and coming into the uh, existing supply, the actual amount that they hold has gone from 13.02 million up to 13.03 million. So just a very modest 10,000 BTC rise. Uh, and that shows that a lot of these Bitcoin miners are in this shark, to, shark and whale range because despite the percentage of their supply being held uh, is going down, their overall amount has gone up ever so slightly. So long story short, prices, especially since mid-October, have absolutely exploded, got up 65, 66%. Uh, but the supply held by sharks and whales are arguably going down just a tiny bit, um, leading to what would imply is a slight bearish divergence 
heading into the big ETF decision. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, I'm glad that you ended off with that bit of a summary there because my next question to you was, how might we be able to interpret this and how can we position ourselves? I know that as soon as that, that last question came out of my mouth, it uh, made me realize that it could be construed as um, a financial advice. And of course, I just want to reiterate that nothing that we do say here is financial advice. Uh, but to the best of your ability, how might someone in our position uh, take this information and um, use it to the best of our abilities. Yeah, it, it really using our metrics is all about probabilities. There's no certainty in crypto, and um, even even when history has repeated itself ten times prior, there's always uh, room for the eleventh time to be the big anomaly where you know whales and sharks go down, but prices still explode, and that's kind of been the case for the last three months. Uh, because whales and sharks have not been accumulating, um, the the implication is that prices would never go as high as they have been. But due to so much ETF optimism uh, and sentiment going the way it has, uh, there's been there's been a push from smaller traders to keep keep prices churning along. Um, I, I think based on probabilities, you want to hedge your risks a little bit, be a bit. Uh, conservative of course until the announcement comes down which may be any minute now or i think any hour now i should say um and don't put all your chips in the middle when you're seeing that the big key stakeholders aren't doing the same themselves uh so that's that's kind of the the general advice that i can give without going into uh investment advice because we don't know here at sentiment we're not we're not all all-knowing beings that know where markets are going to go next, but we can say with probability uh, that in this particular circumstance, uh, there is a, a likelier uh, sign of a kind of a buy the rumor, sell the news phenomenon with this ETF, where anything but like, you know, all ETFs are approved today might actually be disappointing news for people. And you can buy that with the fact that big key stakeholders have not really been accumulating, um, and and there's still a bit of a concern that, you know, 50k might might take a little longer than people want it to. So there's two big takeaways there. Um, I, I'm I love the fact that we're we're landing the plane here, talking about, um, you know, being being very cautious with your investments and not putting all of your eggs in one basket. Uh, the other takeaway though is that. It's encouraging to know that the whales and the sharks don't hold all the power. And because there is such a high volume of people who hold less than 10 Bitcoin, there's still a huge amount of influence that they also have on the market here, um, which which is encouraging to me here. So um, I, I want to, we only have a couple of minutes have a left here. There. Oh, please, please. Yeah, yeah, because it's connected to that. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but... Uh... So I don't know if you guys have any sort of estimate of what is the range of in which the rise moves when, for instance, these whales uh, decide to dump. Because based on what you have been telling us and now in the data that I've seen here, it doesn't seem like it's going to be like a super huge effect like one might imagine. So I'm curious to know if you guys have done that study before or if you have any ideas about you know, of all our numbers. Yeah, we certainly believe in psychological support levels like round numbers such as 50K. There's undoubtedly, if you talk about the next sell level where a lot of people have limit sells, it's going to be at a round number like 50,000, undoubtedly. Um, so generally there's there's going to be, if, if and when prices hit that number, which could be today or tomorrow or three months from now, uh, there's usually a a uh, some some phenomenon where we reach 50k and then drop below it as many sell walls get hit, and then if if whales and sharks are accumulating at that point, then it would quickly zoom past 50k and and go from there until we see the next historical resistance level, which I believe last happened in late 2021 or, or early 2022 when we were still above 50k um and there are some ta traders out there who know those resistance and support levels far better than myself uh but generally speaking 
the big round numbers of 40k would be the the um, supports 50k would be the resistance um i think 44k in particular is where we saw a lot of polarity recently so if you're talking about very recent uh resistance levels that would be one to look at um our founder named maxim is is a savant when it comes to uh elliot waves and um other ta tools like bollinger bands so he he has some precise uh prices that he sometimes talks about on our weekly calls um and you can even review on our our youtube channel what some of those numbers are that he discussed uh but generally i would look at the psychological numbers you know I, Crypto is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy a lot of times. And when the crowd uh, tends to emphasize those big round numbers, those are where the polarization tend to jump in. So 50K is undoubtedly where you'll see a lot of push and pull, assuming the ETFs or some, at least one ETF gets approved today and people take it as positive news and try to push up prices toward that 50K uh, number. I would presume there's going to be uh, some tug of war going on at that level. Um, and if not, if it goes the other direction, then 44K would be the immediate short-term one, and 40K would be the more large long-term one. Awesome. I'm, I'm very encouraged once again that, you know, Amongst all of the, the on-chain data that we have access to, there's still a place for TA. Um, and um, I'm also encouraged to know that Elliott Wave Theory, there is some legitimacy behind that. That's something I've, I've been dabbling into here and there. And uh, you've, you've motivated me to take a bit of a deeper dive here. So, um, yeah, no, thank you for that. I appreciate that. So, um, Brian, we've only got a couple minutes left here. So I want to give you the liberty to walk us through um, any other part of sentiment that you think might provide the most value to our audience, uh, something that might uh, get us get, get everyone excited here to use, and maybe we'll encourage them to take um, take a little bit more thought when it comes to informing yourself um, before making moves and doing your DD when it comes to things like on chain analysis and uh, and you know um, observing the social sentiment behind what's actually going on in the market. So I'm gonna send the mic your way and. Whatever you feel like walking us through here, the the mic is all yours. Yeah, sure. So on my screen here, I'm showing a metric known as weighted sentiment, which is uh, one we put a lot of emphasis on. Uh, it's a, a hybrid metric that combines the amount of social discussion related to an asset and multiplies that by the ratio of positive versus negative commentary going on uh, for that asset. So we're looking at both the amount of discussion and relating that to how positive versus negative people are about it. And uh, generally speaking, when you see the weighted sentiment bar getting very, very high, and like it is right now, uh, that's a sign of FOMO and a bit of greed going on. People trying to buy on the way up uh, in most cases. Um, obviously, as we speak, you know, prices are climbing, trying to get to 47K, um, and people are highly anticipating the ETF approval announcement today. Um, so with that, uh, we're in kind of a weird spot where a lot is going to be based on the news rather than just irrational FOMO versus FUD. Uh, but in a vacuum, you want to be cautious when weighted sentiment is euphoric like it is now, and you want to be greedy when uh, weighted sentiment is extremely pessimistic and skeptical of uh, prices, kind of like what we saw during the FTX collapse last November. Um, so that's a great one to keep an eye on. We also have these awesome models, um, and I'm showing on my screen now uh, a, a snippet of the asset activity matrix, uh, which I programmed uh, a few months back. And what this does, if you're an altcoin trader, this is like paradise because it gives you a glimpse as to which assets are the hottest or coldest at any given moment in terms of their overall network activity, looking at things like the amount of unique addresses interacting on the network, the um, amount of new addresses being, being created, um, the amount of whale transactions, um, how high its social dominance is, uh, or even whether coins are tending to move out of exchanges more 
were on to exchanges more with the latter being bearish and the former being bullish. So uh, we really recommend using models like these, which basically just use a plugin that you can have on uh, Google Sheets. Uh, you make a copy of the existing model and you'll see all of the hot and cold squares like this pop right up to tell you uh, which altcoins you should have a special eye on uh, if you like making money. So I'd say in short, Take a look at, at the activity matrix for a lot of altcoin decisions. Take a look at weighted sentiment like this for, um, you know, crowd driven rallies that are around the corner. And you can even look at just our overall data screener, uh, which I think is underutilized by our community right now. And you can look at, you know, kind of a overall uh, kind of one page synopsis of, of how markets are doing. You can look at the one day social volume changes for the top hundred or so assets. You can look at price changes in a very organized, um, you know, positive versus negative price change percentage visual like this, the overall market cap over a week span, whether it's going up or down, you know, you can change price prices to seven days, get a quick glimpse of what, what the hot assets have been. Over the past week, Hex, of course, is leading the way up 72%. You can even change to 30 days where we can see that SEI has almost tripled over the past 30 days. So this is a great way to just get some overall context uh, on the markets. When you're trying to figure out how to optimize your portfolio, you can filter by you know price volatility, trading volume, social dominance, you know even development activity where we... We have a very popular metric to show which which projects out there have the most active teams that are genuinely trying to improve and innovate their projects, which is a pretty important aspect when it comes to um, trustability and, and deciding on which projects are worth you or hard-earned money. I am, uh, I am taken back by how easy it is to take in so much data in any one moment. Uh, just whoever's not looking at the screen share right now, um, it's just there's so much here just ready for us to to take a look at and consume here. And if you're a visual learner like me, who very much enjoys doing deep dives into different tokens and different protocols and to really get a sense on what's happening right now, you're, you're going to love sentiment because it takes all of this data that can be very difficult and time consuming to to interpret and just brings it to light essentially, which, um, which for me is a huge win here. So, um, just about wrapping up here, um, Brian, I want to, I want to uh, quickly give you one more opportunity to let everybody know how we can support you, uh, how they can get involved, how they can check out sentiment. Uh, before I do that though, I just want to quickly touch base with you, Victor, see where you're at and see if you had any other thoughts on that, uh, on everything that's been happening here. Yes, I have uh, one final question, which is a surprise and is part of a series of questions that I want to implement in our spaces going forward, which I think is going to be interesting. So I don't know if, uh, should I wait or should I go on right now? I'm going to leave that to Brian, uh, depending on how much time you have, my friend. Please feel free. Absolutely, yeah. So my question is, what is the alpha from your unit perspective? So what do I mean by this? Uh, they all have certain information or certain belief of someone that you know, but sometimes it's overdoing in the market, right? So uh, if it is maybe uh, something related uh, with your platform and the tokens and things that you have been seeing in here, amazing, but maybe it's just something that you know that nobody's looking into the industry, maybe some trend or something that you know is quite likely to happen. So whatever it is, the alpha from your perspective, what would that be? Uh, so if I'm understanding it correctly, if I'm understanding your question, you're asking what, what metrics uh, we typically keep an eye on that give the best lips at future market movement. Is that correct? That could be one possibility, but another one uh, could be something that you are personally looking into and that maybe is not in the platform. Like, it's, it's completely open, up to you. Sure, yeah, I think um, 
you know, as far as things on our platform, we like to keep a very close eye on sentiments, uh, first and foremost, seeing, seeing how the crowd perceives the markets and understanding what the correct counter, uh, trading strategy would be. Um, and especially when they get extreme, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call. So the top alpha out there is to understand what the common narrative is among the, you know, millions of traders and what they're saying online, and then ensuring that you aren't falling into the same trap, even if they're all correct. Um, and, and they, they say that, uh, crypto is all going to the moon. If they all believe that that's going to delay the likelihood of that happening now, uh, even if they're right about that years from now. So I think the alpha is really watching what the crowd believes, um, and then watching what the actual, um, money movements are among the large traders, uh, the sharks and whales, uh, who are generally silent, you know, the smaller, the trader, the more vocal they tend to be, uh, those that have millions and tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of dollars in crypto, they're not the ones talking online about, you know, how big, uh, you know, of a pump they expect to happen. They're just quietly moving their money, uh, according to what they believe is going to happen or. Uh, perhaps they have insider information related to the project's developers. Who knows? But uh, pay attention to what the crowd believes and make sure you aren't uh, going with that common narrative and then go with what the large holders are doing in terms of their money, uh, not so much what they're saying. Uh, I think those are the two primary elements of alpha. And then, of course, on a, a lower level, that, but still important, just pay attention to the overall utility of any asset at any given time, because more utility logically is going to help a network grow over time. The primary purpose of these networks existing is so that they're actually used. And if no one is using them and that all the coins are just staying stagnant, um, that could be a sign that uh, the coin has limited potential to grow in market cap. Thank you so much, Trav. I give the mic back to you. Amazing. Uh, I'm so thrilled with that. That's going to be clipped about 18 different ways. I'm so grateful for that uh, that last drop there, Brian. It, it sums up a lot of what I've been trying to communicate for a very long time. And I believe personally that this is exactly what the space needs to hear now more than ever. And to just kind of bring that to light, uh, one of your recent videos, you spoke about how using your platform when you're noticing tokens that are, are trending and absolutely pumping, particularly the ones that are going against the narrative um, or the ones that are diverging from the price of Bitcoin, 72% of the time, they're going to reverse, um, what was it, over 70 to 80% or something along those lines. I don't remember the precise number, um, but you've actually been able to show data and um, analysis to, to prove this. And um, I think there's a lot of power there. And I'm grateful for you being here. And I'm grateful for you for you summarizing that um, in such a concise and and tangible way here. So, uh, Brian, I wanna I wanna give you the mic here. Any final words that you have before you have to take off? It's all yours. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much again for for taking the time to share this incredibly uh, powerful information with us all, and um, helping all of us just be more aware and more smart. Or more smart. Jeez, that was our, uh, an oxymoron. Uh, smarter uh, with our liquidity in this space here. So it's all yours, Brian. Yeah, my pleasure, Travis. I, I think you summed it up really well about five minutes ago when you said uh, that sentiment is is uh, really useful in its ability to organize and visualize complex data into something meaningful. That's really what we're about. If you have to remember, um, all blockchain information is publicly available. We don't have some sort of private connection to information that nobody else has access to. But due to the hard work of our developers, we've managed to put uh, put all that information that is publicly available into something curated um, and organized so that you don't have to go through um, hours and hours and days and days of data just to find a simple answer to your question. Uh, we structure and organize things so that you can quickly come to a conclusion in no time. Uh, just like Bloomberg does with equities. And uh, I think that's important to remember. Uh, we are here to to provide information in 
uh, as as efficient of a manner as we possibly can for you. And we're always open to feedback. So that's why we have this wonderful community that um, constantly keeps us on our toes and gives us uh, enlightening ideas to improve all the time. And we're kind of the people's uh, data platform more than anything. We want to make sure that it is uh, able to be used as easily and as efficiently as possible at all times. And uh, Twitter spaces like this with you guys and your excellent questions really helps, uh, you know, get get our platform out to more people. And, and that's what we really would like to do right now. So I look forward to doing it again with you guys and uh, cheer to hopefully good news coming in the next few hours to make to make markets continue to climb the way they have been. Yeah, much appreciated, my friend. Um, oh, I was muted there. Uh, classic trap mop here. Um, beautifully summarized. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for putting in the work. Um, I've been. I was able to see that you guys have been. Uh, the sentiment has been established for at least five years. Um, so you guys have been here, continuing to build through so many different cycles, so many different events, and it shows them through your work and through um, how you present this information with us today that you know what the heck that you're talking about and you also are doing it for reasons that align with um, exactly what we're trying to bring and highlight in this space and that's people who are here building for the people to help empower everyone so that we can turn dgens to responsible traders and uh, we can make the most out of web th web three here so uh we're probably going to keep this space going a few more minutes here brian um, but, um, of course, you know, take off whenever you need to. Um, and I imagine that's now, uh, but I just wanted to thank you again, one more time for taking the time to, to be with us today and, uh, sharing such valuable information with us. Truly, truly grateful. Yeah, no worries at all. Uh, I will, I will head on out now because I've got another call, uh, in just a few minutes, but, uh, I want to thank everyone who tuned in and of course, uh, both of you for organizing this great call. It was a pleasure. Excellent. Much love, Brian.